Welcome to the Alaska Weather Show. I'm meteorologist Peter Chan coming to you from the National Weather Service. And yes, it is the 4th of July holiday weekend, Saturday, July 3rd, 2021. And as always, if you'd like additional weather information, you can find all sorts of things online at weather.gov forward slash Alaska, or you can call 1-800-472-0391 for a recorded, recorded phone line forecast. Well, for our holiday weekend, the 4th of July is going to be wet and cool throughout much of the western portion of the state and the far north, especially along the Brooks Range. But warmer, drier weather will be further east, especially east central areas along the Elkan border and down through uh, portions of the uh, southeast panhandle. Fire danger will remain highest uh, through east central areas, especially along the Tanana Valley. And then we've been talking about this uh, just heat dome, this uh, large ridge of high pressure that's been sitting over uh, the western United States, Pacific Northwest. It continues to hold there over the western lower 48. It's going to continue uh, just to really dry out that region and cause uh, some extreme fire danger for the western U.S. Meanwhile, the Bering Low that's been very stubborn, just kind of sitting out there, broad area of low pressure across the Bering Sea, is going to begin to shift a bit eastward and that's going to spread the wet and cooler weather from the west side of the state uh, into central and south central areas early and through the middle part of next week. So here's where the fire danger is highest uh, near and south of Fairbanks and then on up uh, along the Tanana River all the way to Northway. And so if you are going to be out uh, this weekend, especially in uh, central and east central areas uh, camping or doing any type of outdoor recreating, please be extremely careful with any fire. As far as the satellite imagery, you can see more in the way of cloud cover today up through uh, the Fairbanks uh, and uh, Fort Yukon areas where they had sunshine temperatures in the 80s Thursday and Friday. It's cooled down. Readings are only in the 70s, but still some sun trying to break out through parts of the southeast panhandle. And that'll be the case again on Sunday, the July 4th. In fact, Ketchikan has a shot at getting temperatures back up in the 70s, whereas uh, the west side of the state's stuck under the cloud cover. Broad area of low pressure extends from the Bering Strait all the way back down toward the western Aleutians. And in the southwest flow aloft, we get these troughs of low pressure that just kind of rotate northeast to northward and wrap around that area of low pressure, bringing waves of rain and showers. Uh, to uh, the portions of the Aleutians on up into the Alaska Peninsula and much of the western half of the state. There's also boundary that's kind of stalled out there along the Brooks Range and North Slopes that's going to bring uh, additional rainfall here through the weekend and a little cooler temperatures. But otherwise, uh, this pattern will uh, at least uh, be holding before it starts to shift a bit eastward as we go into early next week. And that big ridge of high pressures uh, continues to influence uh, northwest Canada. Uh, with warm temperatures, Dawson down toward Whitehorse, and again, parts uh, eastern parts of the state should see temperatures maybe uh, warm again back up uh, into the 80s here as we get into uh, especially Sunday, Monday time frame as uh, that's where the driest air will be in place. So on today's weather map, we have a thermal trough of low pressure extending back across northern areas through the Brooks Range, and it's along this boundary we're seeing areas of rain, pretty good soaking in some spots, uh, over half an inch of rainfall. And then as we go back down through the southwestern and western uh, third of the state, it's, it's seeing showers or even some steadier rain. And uh, there's another little uh, weak low pressure circulation on the Pacific side of the Alaska Peninsula lifting off toward the north and weakening. Another one is back toward the central Aleutians, and that's going to bring some more uh, rain for later this weekend uh, as, as it uh, works its way on up toward the northeast. You can see tonight that feature lifting up into the uh, at least the tip of the Alaska Peninsula with a ridge of high pressure in place over the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, that's uh, at least helping to keep areas of the east and southeast drier. So uh, on Sunday, 4th of July, uh, driest weather will be uh, the east, southeast part of the state. Meanwhile, the far north and the western areas will continue to see areas of rain, especially coastal areas there of the west, Seward Peninsula down into uh, the lower Yukon and Kuskokwim River basins. And then uh, into the day on Monday, uh, that low is, the upper low is going to begin to shift eastward from out of the Bering, and that's going to try to spread some more showers further inland across central and south central areas. Meanwhile, though, still should have some pretty good weather uh, along the Elkan border and especially across portions of uh, the southeast panhandle. So low temperatures 
uh, for Sunday morning. Forth will be down uh, around 50 degrees uh, in the uh, inner waterways of the southeast and generally uh, upper 40s to around 50 uh, across south central areas. Temperatures Sunday afternoon warmest through uh, the southeast interior, 74 at Glen Allen and 70 at Ketchikan. You get a little more sun, you could be in, in at least the lower 70s. Uh, coastal areas uh, along the Kenai generally in the lower 60s as well as as you get down toward the Alaska Peninsula and then Monday morning lows will generally be uh, low mid 50s across the southeast upper 40s to around 50 throughout south central areas Kenai and Kodiak and then temperatures uh, Monday afternoon will generally be uh, 60s to a few lower 70s there across uh, the southeast panhandle warmer temperatures as you get north of uh, Glen Allen especially up in the east central areas I'll show you there in a moment and areas along uh, Cook Inlet generally in the lower 60s. So here uh, to the north, uh, low temperatures Sunday morning will be down in the mid 30s to near 40 degrees, lower 50s, uh, the middle uh, and upper Yukon Valley. And temperatures Sunday afternoon, not as warm as what they were on Thursday and Friday, generally lower 70s, mid 70s though, Arctic Village down toward Northway. And then uh, only in the upper 40s to lower 50s, the Seward Peninsula. And lows Monday morning will generally be mid-upper 30s along the Arctic coast, North Slope, and lower 50s up through the Yukon Valley, 40s there in the western uh, portion of the Seward Peninsula. And temperatures Monday afternoon could get back up uh, low to mid-80s across portions of uh, the east central region, especially along the Alcan border, and generally lower 50s there throughout the northwest coast and down through the Seward Peninsula. Sunday morning lows will generally be in the uh, mid to upper 40s across uh, all of the southwest. And then uh, as we get into the afternoon hours with the cloud cover in place there, uh, Nome down toward uh, oh, King Salmon, uh, the Bristol Bay area, highs only in the low mid 50s with periods of rain. And then extending out through the Aleutians, highs not much more than 50-ish. And then for Monday morning lows will generally be in the uh, 40s to around 50 degrees. And for Monday afternoon, uh, temperatures will still generally be in the 50s under cloud cover and periods of rain uh, there uh, throughout most of the interior of the southwest and then generally 50s out across the Alaska Peninsula and uh, upper 40s to lower 50s there in the Aleutians. Here is the temperature outlook as we're approaching mid-July. So that's uh, the 6 to 10 day outlook from July 9th through the 13th. And again, look down toward the bottom of your screen. It shows you the Western United States just brick red there because that's really above normal temperatures beneath that heat dome. We should see cooler temperatures across much of the state, especially south central areas. And as uh, the low begins to shift eastward, at least uh, the trend will be six to 10 days out that precipitation may end up to be a bit below normal, near to a bit below normal across the southern half of the state. So uh, especially those of you in the southwest and the Alaska Peninsula would enjoy a respite from all of the cloudy and wet weather. So here we are kind of stuck in this pattern and we'll hold here uh, for a little while longer, at least uh, another week to maybe two weeks, but there are signs it could shift out. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Here's your look at your flying weather if you're heading out this 4th of July on Sunday or into Monday. Uh, we continue to have a large ridge of high pressure sitting over northwest Canada, bringing uh, clearer skies, warmer temperatures that extend into east central areas of Alaska. Whereas uh, out over the bearing, we have an elongated area of low pressure, a couple circulations that continue to keep moisture, lower cloud cover, and some precipitation rotating up through the Alaska Peninsula and especially the west side of the state where we'll continue to see IFR conditions Sunday morning. And as we go into uh, Sunday afternoon, we will see uh, at least uh, a chance of an isolated thunderstorm popping up on the east end of the uh, Brooks Range around Arctic Village, east of Attigan Pass, but generally VFR conditions across uh, two thirds of the eastern interior with some IFR conditions over the northern Gulf back along the Pacific side of the Alaska Peninsula and uh, much of the Bering as well as off of the Arctic coast. Similarly, on Monday morning, we see IFR conditions just along and off of the Arctic coast. Areas of IFR intruding inland across western areas and on up through the Kuskokwim and Yukon River valleys. Uh, IFR conditions out over the northern Gulf along the North Pacific, extending down the length of the Alaska Peninsula into the Aleutians and much of the Bering. And a few isolated thunderstorms could redevelop there, especially just north of the Yukon Flats and also along the Elkan border there in the southeast interior. 
And as we take a look at uh, past conditions on Sunday for the 4th of July, Anna Tuvik will see MVFR conditions becoming VFR. And similarly at Attigan, though there is a chance you could encounter an isolated thunderstorm developing with the daytime heating east of Attigan Pass. And as we go further south and west, Lake Clark and Merrill, IFR conditions in the morning, kind of sort of in between IFR and MVFR, giving way to MVFR for the day. Rainy Pass, MVFR becoming VFR. And Windy may see an interval of IFR conditions overnight into early Sunday morning, becoming VFR later in the morning and afternoon. And as we go further east, Isabel, as well as Mentasta, should generally hold on to VFR conditions uh, throughout the day on Sunday. Tanita could see an interval of IFR conditions in the early morning, becoming though VFR. And Portage, generally MVFR in the morning, becoming VFR by afternoon. And as we go into uh, northern areas of the southeast panhandle, Chilkoot and White will start out MVFR becoming VFR with some rather uh, pleasant weather setting up there, especially the south end of the, uh, uh, the panhandle where Ketchikan can see temperatures in the 70s. Freezing levels, though, are quite high over northwest Canada and the southeast panhandle, uh, over 10,000 feet and in some cases around and just over 12,000 feet. Off to the west, though, freezing levels drop to below 6,000 feet. The uh, Seward Peninsula out across much of the northern bearing in response uh, where the cooler pool of air aloft is associated with that elongated area of low pressure. And uh, as far as potential for some icing, we are going to see areas of rain moving along, especially the south slopes of the Brooks Range. Uh, between 8,000 and 14,000 feet, there is that potential for uh, some icing. Also there along the west coast, between 6,000 and 12,000 feet, including the uh, YK deltas, and then back out through the central Aleutians, uh, between 8,000 and 16,000 feet. Upper level jet stream winds at 30,000 feet. Uh, we have that high pressure centered over uh, the southeast panhandle. And then out toward the west, low pressure extending from the northern through uh, northern uh, bearing down to uh, the western and central Aleutians. And ahead of that, 130 knot jet core there south of the uh, central Aleutians with winds out of the west aloft at uh, 130 knots. Okay, take a look at down down to 9,000 feet. Still that mid-level high showing up over northwest Canada. Back to the west, though, we have uh, southwest winds coming on shore there through the uh, southwest coast at 40 knots, and then south of the eastern Aleutians, there's a wind max of 50 to 65 knots from the west, and bringing it down to 3,000 feet. Still have those uh, low pressure circulations out over the bearing. And uh, out over Canada there, in interior northwest Canada, the thermal lows, so it's not much in a way of circulation showing up with winds coming in along the southwest coast from the southwest, generally uh, around 30, 35 knots. And a quick check of turbulence. We do have one little pocket uh, surface to 6,000 feet northwest of uh, Koyukuk uh, and over just east of the uh, uh, Granite Mountain Air Force Station and then also out over the central Aleutians in the vicinity of ADAC between surface and 4,000 feet. So that's your flight weather for uh, the 4th of July into Monday. If you are heading out, please have a safe flight. Leatherbacks are the largest turtles on Earth, growing up to 7 feet long and weighing more than 2,000 pounds. These sea turtles are among the most highly migratory animals on Earth, some traveling up to 10,000 miles a year between their nesting and feeding grounds. Prevalent in every ocean except the Arctic and Antarctic, the species overall is declining, more so in the Pacific. In the Eastern Pacific, the Mexican population was once thought to be the largest in the world and has experienced an alarming decline. This trajectory of decline that we've seen and actually collapse, we're talking about only 20 or 30 turtles nesting every year where thousands used to just 40 years ago. That's the kind of dramatic decline. The Western Pacific population has been declining steadily and it's particularly critical to act now before it collapses while there are enough turtles in nests to respond to conservation measures but threats to all leatherbacks in the Pacific need to be addressed. The top threats to populations are uncontrolled coastal development, all the bad stuff on the nesting beaches, egg harvest, poaching of the females,
Predation on the eggs by dogs and pigs. A deforestation makes the sand too warm and dry for the and the eggs don't hatch. So another one is incidental capture in fishing gear. During their vast migrations, they get caught in fishing gear throughout the Pacific. And finally, marine debris, which the leatherbacks mistake for their favorite food, jellyfish, and they choke on those. Protecting leatherbacks in U.S. waters alone is not enough to ensure the continued existence of the species. The highly migratory nature of Pacific leatherbacks requires cooperation and international collaboration. NOAA is focusing on partnerships with Mexico, Central America, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands in the Pacific. Our action plan promotes a holistic recovery strategy that addresses all the sources of mortality. So that's basically ensuring that the remaining nesting sites are protected and the nests produce as many hatchlings as possible. And then secondly, in tandem with that is reducing the fisheries related mortalities. We're working with international partners to incentivize co community participation on the nesting beach conservation and developing alternative livelihood programs that wean communities off leatherback resources and introduce alternative methods for food and income. Recovery is going to take a long time, on the order of 20 to 30 years at least before we see some of these actions bear fruit. But here in the U.S., we can all help leatherbacks by making seafood choices, for instance, that support sustainable fishing practices. And beachgoers can certainly do their part by keeping our oceans clean of plastic debris, picking up marine litter, particularly plastic bags. Together with our partners, we are strengthening protection and conservation efforts to ensure a future for leatherbacks helping them to survive and once again thrive in the waters of the Pacific Ocean. For over 40 years, NOAA scientists have been collecting data and piecing together the story of the gray whale. Each year, new discoveries are made, revealing the secrets of this ancient traveler. With the northeastern Pacific population recovered, leading scientists from the NOAA Southwest Fisheries Science Center continue their research efforts to help save the western population from extinction. The most effective way to identify individuals and count the population is to photograph them from the surface. Using the gray whale's distinctive markings and gray spots caused by parasites on their skin, scientists document these characteristics to identify individuals. So we're able to track migratory pathways and corridors by the simple use of photo identification. There are other ways to do that as well, biopsy sampling and genetics. And from the air. Aerial photography is one way you can study animals based on their size and shape. So you can learn a lot about nutritive and reproductive condition of whales just by measuring their size and shape from vertical aerial photographs. You can also put satellite transmitters on them and track them remotely. You put the transmitter on and let them go and you watch them move across the Pacific or down to China or wherever it might be. To further learn and discover where these great sojourners swim, the team of researchers traveled to Russia and set up camp on Sakhalin Island. The main focus of our research uh, while we were on Sakhalin was to collect photo identification. If it was a whale that we had not collected a genetic sample from previously, we would also attempt to collect a sample from the whales. Whereas whales are endowed with natural insulation, their human observers must gear up to brave the cold in order to study these marine giants up close. We're typically only able to work about one third of the time that we're there, and that's mostly due to this fog that just invades the area and 
sit sometimes for weeks on end. So it can be very challenging to try and do field work in this site. Recently, two whales from the western population surprised scientists by migrating across the Pacific to the waters of California and Mexico. It's a really fun finding. It's added another piece to the puzzle that we didn't previously know about. And I would have to say that it's opened up more questions than we had before. Research scientists from Japan, Russia, and the United States share images of animals they've spotted. We take a photograph of an individual off of Sakhalin Island, and we get a phone call from Japanese scientists, and they say, hey, guess what? We've got a picture of a gray whale in Japan. We say, can you send it to us? We'd love to try and match it. They'll send us the picture, we'll compare it to our catalog, and they'll say, hey, we've got a match from Sakhalin to Japan. Unlike many species of whales that still remain on the endangered species list, the Eastern Pacific gray whale, once on the brink of extinction, now numbers about 20,000 individuals. Recovery efforts that started 40 years ago and the ongoing research and monitoring by NOAA scientists have contributed to the conservation of the gray whales. Together with legal protection and public education, scientists are playing their part to ensure the survival of this magnificent migratory animal. And now, marine weather around Alaska. We start off our marine weather segment, as usual, with the sea ice edge. And you can see the Chukchi Sea has a lot of open water, and uh, that little bit of ice still remains, but it continues to rapidly melt out there in Kotzebue Sound. And as we go up along the Arctic coast, still areas of ice, though, it will continue to break up here as we uh, move deeper into uh, July. But as far as uh, Sunday's marine forecast across uh, the southeast panhandle, the inner waterways will see west-northwest winds 10 to 15 knots, Petersburg down toward Ketchikan with three-foot waves, and then Juneau northward up along Lynn Canal, uh, four or five-footers, south winds 25 knots. And along the Pacific um, side, or I should say the Gulf side, winds will be northwesterly around 20 knots, swells eight to nine feet south of Gustavus, and westerly 15 knots with seven-foot uh, swells Yakutat westward. And then on uh, Monday, look for northwest winds 10 to 15 knots along the southern end of the inner waterways and waves 2 to 3 feet. North end, Lynn Canal, uh, south winds 20 knots, waves 3 to 4 feet. And again, uh, along the uh, Gulf side coast there, 15 to 20 knot winds from the northwest, swells 6 to 8 feet. But generally, west winds 10 to 15 knots from Yakutat westward with 6 foot swells. South central areas on Sunday will see uh, winds generally out of the southwest 10 to 15 knots on the Gulf side, uh, 10 knots uh, southwesterly with two footers there in Prince William Sound. And then down the length of uh, the Cook Inlet, uh, we're looking at 10 to 15 knot uh, winds out of the northeast with waves of two to maybe four feet at the mouth of Cook Inlet. And on Monday, get a little more channeling southeast winds up to 30 knots at the entrance of Cook Inlet with eight footers otherwise along uh, the Kenai winds out of the south to west at 10 to 20 knots waves three to four feet and uh, winds out of the southeast 10 knots and waves two feet in Prince William Sound. Across Kodiak Island winds will be out of the southeast 10 to 15 knots uh, and then uh, shifting more to the south southwest as we go down along the Alaska uh, Peninsula at 15 to 20 knots waves five to six feet on the Gulf and North Pacific side. Bearing side two to three feet and on uh, Monday look for Winds uh, more generally out of the southwest, 20 to 25 knots, so they could approach 30 knots south of Sand Point with swells on the Pacific side, 8 to 9 feet and 2 to 5 feet on the Bering side. Throughout the Aleutian chain, winds are going to go from southwest to south, generally in the 20 to 25 knot range, swells 6 to 7 feet on the North Pacific side and 4 to 7 feet on the Bering side, and then Monday, Look for across the uh, eastern half of the Aleutians, winds out of the southwest 25 to near 30 knots, eight to nine foot waves on the Pacific side and six to seven feet on the Bering side. The winds will try to turn a little more uh, westerly as, as you get out along the uh, Aleutian chain. 
Looking across uh, the west and southwest coast, uh, open waters uh, of the eastern Bering, south southwest winds 20 knots, uh, waves three to five feet. Offshore flow southeasterly there, Norton Sound and north of uh, Nunavik Island, 20 knots and waves generally four feet. On Monday, we'll see still uh, southwest winds uh, off of uh, the Kuskokwim Delta down towards St. Paul and St. George at 20 knots, six foot waves, but still south southeast winds. Norton Sound to uh, north of Hooper Bay at 20 knots and waves four to five feet. Across the Arctic coast, winds will be somewhat variable around 10 knots, Katavik over toward uh, Utiatavik, and then dropping southward down uh, toward uh, Cape Lisburn and uh, Kotzebue Sound. Winds will be southeasterly 15 to 20 knots, waves three or four feet. And on Monday, uh, look for a gradient to increase a bit there along the Arctic coast, upwards to 25 knots from the east, as there'll be an area of high pressure centered there north of the Beaufort Sea. And uh, winds uh, as we get down along the uh, northwest coast will generally be offshore there at Point Lay and Wainwright, as well as out of Kotzebue Sound, 15 to 20 knots and waves three to four feet uh, in the Chukchi Sea. So on Sunday in the weather map, we'll continue to see a broad area of low pressure situated over the Bering and a couple of waves of uh, low pressure troughs lifting northeastward. And a uh, ridge of high pressure remains in place, kind of trapping the uh, marine layer over the uh, Gulf Coast. And then as we get into Monday, that low, that broader upper level, mid-level low that's sitting over the Bering is going to try to shift eastward into the west side of the state, bringing with it a couple troughs of low pressure and some additional rains, uh, especially along the uh, Alaska Peninsula on up through the western uh, half of the state. Some of that moisture spreading up into south central areas and the interior. So. That's your marine weather, and again, I want to wish everyone a happy 4th of July weekend. Certainly, I hope you're having a good one thus far, and uh, please uh, be sure, sure to join me again here come tomorrow evening. I'll be back, and uh, as always, join us here at the same time, same place. Thank you for watching. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbormaster before you go boating.